In this video, we will look at the incentives that miners, or more broadly speaking, consensus relevant nodes actually have. We look at a simplified P&L, so the revenue side as well as the cost side of these miners, study some very simplified attack vectors, some attacking scenarios, and also analyze the incentives these miners have to actually follow someone else's lead, then they find the new wallet block. All right, so let's get started. In the last few lectures, we talked about consensus protocols, and we also talked about various uh, scenarios with forks. Uh, we've quickly looked into forks that are just temporary, but also forks that can be persistent, essentially split the network for good. And we also talked about the fact that both of these cases can add a lot of uncertainty and essentially uh, destroy value. I mean, um, obviously, it's going to negatively impact the value of a specific uh, network when there is more uncertainty, when there uh, are some situations in which you cannot be sure what's actually going on. That's usually not a good place to be in. And for this reason, <laughs> it is really important to um, create incentives for the network that this doesn't happen, that that you can actually get around these forks, that you can actually reach a common understanding. And that is exactly what we'll look at in this lecture. So we're looking into uh, various subtopics of how these different agents in the network are incentivized and how we can make sure that in, uh, in the usual case, so usually uh, there is a consensus reached. And in particular, the focus of this lecture is the uh, general incentives for consensus relevant nodes. So in the Bitcoin case for miners, for proof of work miners, uh, then Bitcoin specifics and the incentive driving uh, consensus in the, in the Bitcoin case. And then of course, consensus attacks, potential attack vectors and what may go wrong. Um, I will give you some examples. Um, although I have to say right now, and this is really important to understand, most of these examples are severe simplifications. Just to give you the intuition, uh, to give you the, some ideas uh, how to think about this stuff. But of course, in reality, uh, things are much more complex than our uh, simplified math examples that we're going to use right here. Okay, so the first thing we're looking into is the economic considerations of a consensus relevant node of a CRN. Um, to get participants to serve as a CRN and bear the corresponding cost, for example, the Bitcoin network with the with the um, computational resources they have to spend for proof of work, um, the network typically offers some revenues, so it incentivizes these people to do so. And we can look at a very simplified P and L right here uh, for. CRNs, so for uh, consensus relevant nodes. On the revenue side, of course, you have the block based rewards. Uh, so, this is the coin based transaction I've told you earlier, uh, where you get the opportunity to grade one output that doesn't require an input. Um, you, can, you can grade that on behalf of any uh, payment conditions or any address, usually. Um, so, you, you grade on behalf of yourself as an incentive, as a, as a reward for, for mining. And then you have the transaction based revenues, the, the fees, so depending on how many transactions are in there, depending on what transactions are in there and the fees they paid, you also get incentivized. And recall that these fees uh, are just the difference between the value of the outputs and the value of the inputs in a transaction that the miners actually get to keep them in the case of Bitcoin. So uh, these are really the two um, main revenue drivers in the case of Bitcoin. So the Coinbase, uh, the output that create, that's created, uh, to create new bitcoins, to incentivize the miners, and also the transaction fees. And then depending on the consensus protocol, this is not the case for Bitcoin, of course, but there are also some attestation rewards. That's usually something you see in proof of stake, something we will talk about next time. Um, and you have minor extractable value or MEV. Um, it exists with Bitcoin, uh, uh, but there are other blockchains uh, with with uh, smart contract applications, especially in a decentralized finance case where this is a, a much greater problem than with the Bitcoin blockchain, this, this minor extractable value. Uh, essentially, the idea is that when miners change the order of transactions or when they change the inclusion of transactions, um, they have some room to extract some value. Uh, it's a it's a really vague definition, 
uh, on purpose because there are so many facets to this. It really depends on the application. But the idea is that uh, due to the power the miner has when, when, when they are creating these blocks uh, with the order, but also with the decision what, what they include, uh, they can extract some value from the system. And that is usually referred to as MVV. So these are really the revenues. That's the revenue side. And on the cost side, uh, of course, it depends on the consensus protocol with proof of work. It's the computational resources, so the electricity, hardware, the maintenance of the hardware, and so on. Uh, with proof of stake, it's the cost of stake, also some hardware, also some maintenance, but mainly, uh, predominantly, the, the stake, so the, the, the tokens you buy uh, and lock up to uh, receive uh, these uh, quote-unquote lottery tickets that allow you to participate in the consensus protocol. Uh, and then proof of authority, so basically when you just have somebody who decides on the current state of the ledger, uh, then there may be some political cost of maintaining this authority. Uh, there are some other costs, uh, like audits, for example, um, that, that are associated with this. Uh, of course, cost of stake and cost of maintaining authority are not applicable in the Bitcoin context. You're really talking about this, these computational resources. And what is important to understand right away is with revenues in the network currency, so in the native protocol asset of the network, with a Bitcoin in the case of the Bitcoin network, and cost most often in fiat currencies, um, CRNs have an incentive to keep the network uh, value and consequently the demand very high so they in other words they don't have an incentive to um, act in a way that hurts the network because they get paid in the network uh, crypto asset in the network currency in the uh, native protocol asset of that blockchain usually uh, and their costs usually are real world costs so um, of course you're not gonna um, usually you're not going to pay your electricity with bitcoin uh, but rather with us dollars euro swiss francs and so on Okay, so this is really the CRN p &L. This is something to keep in mind. And uh, when you look at the market uh, here in the context of Bitcoin with the computational resources that get allocated, and first of all, you have to understand, and that's really the foundation of this market, is that it is an open market. So there are mm, very limited, pretty much no barriers to entry. Um, of course, these days you have to be really, really efficient. So you could argue that this is a barrier to your entry that a uh, private person cannot enter the market anymore because they have to heavily specialized to be able uh, to compete with the large economies of scale that these professionals usually have. But in theory, there are no barriers to entry. Anyone can just decide that they want to join the mining market and then do so, which is a big difference to most of the other systems. And what is important, of course, I mentioned that is that profits uh, can only be achieved. So you can only realize profits when you're when you're more uh, efficient than your competitors. Why is this the case? Um, I mean, there are two situations in an open market, and uh, one would be an under allocation. So this means when you're looking at the marginal revenue uh, that comes down with an increase in the computational power that is in network. Uh, why? Because the, the, the revenue is just split between uh, more people, essentially. Uh, recall that the revenue gets adjusted to the computational resources. So every 10 minutes, you just create uh, this certain amount of Bitcoin, this, this number of Bitcoin, new ones. And that doesn't really get changed because of the computational resources. It's a fixed number on average uh, per 10 minutes and just gets halved every four years. Uh, so what happens when there are more people in the network, when there are more people allocating computational resources to the network, then the marginal revenue comes down and the marginal cost mm, more or less remains the same, or more or less is at the same, um, uh, same value. Um, when you have an open market like that, and that does assume we have an under allocation so that there can be a profit realized right here, that we are in a state uh, with this amount of computational resources right here, where the marginal costs are lower than the marginal revenue. So we do have a profit right here, marginal profit. Uh, then of course, uh, more people have an incentive to actually enter the market and more people enter the market and the revenue will go down. And we have the equilibrium right here. This is the equilibrium value uh, where no one makes a marginal profit anymore. 
on average. Of course, when somebody is much more efficient than others, then they will. But on average, when we assume uh, that the miners are uh, homogenous, let's say, um, then no one will make a profit anymore. And then the other way around, when there is an overallocation, when miners um, actually lose, uh, they may remove some of these computational resources, they may not spend as much anymore, so we move back again to this equilibrium. And uh, this is really the equilibrium value of the computational resources. Now, one thing that would actually increase the uh, marginal revenue is the Bitcoin price. I mean, I, I told you that the number of Bitcoin, except for the reward halving every four years, doesn't change. But when you think about it, since these miners, they get compensated in Bitcoin, when the Bitcoin price skyrockets, then of course, so do the incentives um, to, to spend more resources in this system. Why is this the case? Because when the Bitcoin price skyrockets, this delta right here between marginal revenue uh, denominated in US dollars and marginal cost also denominated in US dollars gets greater. Why? Because when, when you denominate the revenue in US dollars with a constant Bitcoin value and the Bitcoin price increases, then of course this curve would shift upwards right here and then you have a greater revenue. And then of course this point right here, uh, the equilibrium point would shift to the right over here. So with an increasing Bitcoin price, you would see more and more computational resources. Also, the other thing that, that happened a lot is actually that the marginal costs go down, the marginal cost per computation, because there is more and more efficient uh, hardware in, in the space uh, with the move from uh, just regular CPUs um, to um, GPUs, so graphics cards, to uh, FPGAs, to ASICs, or ASICs are chips uh, that are on the hardware level uh, just produced for this one task. So the only thing they can actually do is, create, is computing these SHA-256 hashes, but they can do that really efficiently. Uh, and when you have the specialization at chip level, then of course the marginal cost will go down, come down. So this entire line right here. And when the marginal costs come down, then again, uh, the intersection, uh, right, uh, this intersection right here would also move to the right and you would also see that in higher computational resources. So these are uh, the two main effects why you have this ever-increasing um, demand of resources in the Bitcoin network, first of all, the increased price, and second, the uh, um, more, the higher efficiency of these computational uh, resources that leads to a lower marginal cost per computational unit. So let's go to the probabilistic reward distribution in Bitcoin mining. Uh, on the proof of work, the profitability of a mining a block and earning the corresponding reward, which we define as P, is defined by minor I's, computing or computational resources, relative to the network. And uh, let us denote the individual computational resources as lowercase ci, and the computational resources of the entire network as uppercase c. Uh, and then you have this reward P we have seen right here. Uh, and then the expected value for an individual miner, the expected reward for an individual miner would be uh, E of PI. Okay, so that's that's our notation. It's actually very simple. Um, and it's it's just some simplifications to, to show you some things to, to modulate uh, mining the incentives and later on pool mining. So let us assume that the uh, current reward is 6.25 Bitcoin. So we set P equal to 6.25. Uh, then we have these CI values right here. For Tamara it would be three. For Edith it would be zero. She doesn't mind currently. Uh, for Tony it would be three. Michelle four. Marsha three. Brian, Jake and Claudia one each. And if you add this up, this would be a network computational resource count of 16. Um, so in total you have 16 computational resources uh, and here you have the individual numbers uh, in these circles. So when we go with Jake right here, uh, Jake has one computational resource unit. Uh, Jake's expected payout would be this 6.25 times 1 16th, which would be 0 0.391 Bitcoin units per 10 minutes because we're really talking about time units here. Uh, we're talking about these block cycles, and as you as you've seen uh, a few lectures back, is that this always goes back to these 10 minutes uh, average. Okay, so uh, 
or 0.391 in this case for Jake. Now, um, the thing is that the successful mining of a block follows a Poisson distribution. It's a random process, and this is really important later on that your um, the fact whether you've succeeded or you did not succeed with your current try does not affect your future tries, okay? That's really important to understand and will be important for the next few examples. But also, since it's a random process, since it's a probabilistic process, uh, the short to midterm payouts may deviate, may have a, a high variance, okay? There might be quite some um, deviation from the expected value. Um, and the relatively small miners are disproportionately affected by that. So when you have a relatively low uh, stake in the network, then of course uh, you could be really, really lucky and you could find a block immediately. It's probabilistic, but it could also be that you have to wait for a really, really, really long time. And this makes it somewhat uncertain. It's really hard to plan accordingly. It's really hard to create a business uh, based on that. So what could they do is to address this, Jake, Brian, and Claudia, they can form a mining pool and the mining form is a mining pool. Essentially, it's just the idea that they're bundling their mining resources. So you're saying, okay, we are acting as one miner essentially. And whatever we get, so whenever we find a solution, whenever we create a new block, then we're splitting the rewards uh, among the three of us. So proportionally, depending on how much uh, each of us has contributed to this mining pool, they also get the reward when the mining pool actually finds something, when the mining pool actually creates a, a valid candidate block. So in terms of the expected um, uh, revenue, in terms of the expected reward per block, this would be still be um, the same as you can see right here. This was the original reward of Jake with 6.25 times 1 16th probability. And now it would be 6.25 split among three people. And Jake would just get his share. Uh, Prime and Claudia would also get a, a third each. But he has a, um, an increased probability of actually getting something. And it's increased by three because now he also participates with Prime and Claudia's computational resources. And it can easily be shown that, of course, these two threes right here uh, divided and uh, uh, multiplied by three, they cancel each other out. So you, you unsurprisingly, you still have the same expected value uh, with the mining pool. In terms of the standard deviation, it's a little different. In terms of the standard deviation, of course, you're performing much better in a mining pool. So it would be 0.813 instead of 1.523. Um, and this is really important, again, for businesses. It might be really helpful when you have a lower standard deviation. This means less uncertainty this means you can actually have a plan you can better calculate how much revenue you're going to generate okay uh, many cases by the way this expected value right here isn't exactly the same because usually uh, larger mining pools they also have a fee for for organizing everything for orchestrating everything uh, and then you many people will, will actually be um, willing to accept a somewhat lower expected uh, reward um, because they have to deduct the fees they are paying to the mining pools uh, just for a higher amount of certainty for a more regular uh, payout uh, and something they can actually count on to some extent. Uh, by the way, the way this is implemented uh, in, in a somewhat decentralized way, the mining pools, the way they find out how much computational resources has been allocated to these mining pools is by uh, a second uh, threshold value uh, that is much higher than the actual network threshold value, and then you're when each and every one of these of these mining pool members they are computing their hash values on uh, on a block that has on a block candidate block that has been proposed by the mining pool operator uh, with a with a, a Coinbase reward on behalf of the mining pool operator, and essentially what you have to do. Uh, to get a certain stake, to get a to get a reward from the mining pool, is you have to present your solutions that are below the mining pool threshold value, which is significantly higher, much higher than the network threshold value. So when you create these blocks, uh, you get some shares for the mining pool whenever you're below the higher threshold value, even though this block isn't valid in terms of the of the Bitcoin network. But in that way, um, you can. 
without actually having to observe um, in the uh, server room how much resources or how many resources are spent. You can indirectly observe how many resources each of these people allocated to the mining pool, at least on average, by using a higher threshold value. So it's pretty much the same system of this with the Bitcoin network as a whole. Now, before we can look into the incentives of these miners, or rather these CRN, these consensus relevant nodes, uh, we have to make some assumptions, some basic assumptions. And number one is that they are rational agents. Uh, so we're assuming that they're always acting in their best self-interest, that they're always trying to maximize their own reward. Number two is that they are independent. So uh, we assume that when we're talking about a single entity that they are actually acting on their own behalf, uh, not in line with anyone else. And then we also assume that there is no collusion. Uh, otherwise, we will talk about mining pools and about separate uh, about entities that are combined. And uh, number two, uh, we assume that the value is tied to the network uh, values, so that the reward value is tied to the network value. Why is this the case? Um, why is it important? It's because consensus deviations impair trust um, to the network when you're not acting in accordance with the rules. Um, then, of course, people might be worried and there might be a lower demand in your network. And the lower demand usually means uh, that, number one, there are less transaction fees on the network because no, no one is trading anymore on your network when they don't trust it. And number two, the demand for the actual token for the actual native protocol asset uh, also affects your reward because you're usually rewarded in these, in these native protocol assets. In the case of Bitcoin, um, I mean, it's quite easy to understand when a miner uh, would destroy the Bitcoin network, uh, then of course they would completely destroy their own reward because they're ba being paid in Bitcoin. And this right here, I just said, these are just some additional considerations. We haven't even modeled them in in the examples that follow. And it's just something also to keep in mind. And up here, especially the rationality assumption, that is um, the, the foundation of the very simplified little models uh, I'm going to show you that should help you understand why in a, usually it's a good, it's in the best self-interest of these miners to act in accordance with the rules. Now let's go with a very simplified example and uh, the status quo is that Mich Michelle has uh, successfully mined a block. So block number four right here. Uh, so this block three, that was the status quo. Then Michelle mined this block four right here. And our mining pool uh, now considers whether it should um, work on top of Michelle's block. Uh, so use Michelle's block, this block number four, uh, as the status quo, or actually try to go with an alternative chain. So um, fork here from block three and try to create a successor of block of block three with an alternative chain. Now, going with the alternative chain, um, what, what you would end up with um, is this probability right here, the expected payout. So 3 sixteenths times 3 sixteenths, and then 6.25 times 2. Uh, why 3 sixteenths times 3 sixteenths? It's quite easy to become the longest chain once again, the dominant one that will be accepted. You must, the pool must mine two blocks in a row. So when we were saying, okay, there is are these uh, discrete time periods as a simplification, and always there is one block per being mined. And again, this is a severe simplification, uh, as you know by now. Uh, then the next two blocks that get mined must be mined by this by these uh, by this mining pool. Uh, so we have three sixteenth probability right here, three sixteenth probability right here, and if you succeed in doing so in the next two rounds, uh, then you have the longest chain, and your reward would be six point two five times two, because you have two blocks right here, two blocks of this reward plus uh, potentially transaction fees, of course. With this regard, disregarding the transaction fees for these examples. Okay, so what you would end up with is 0.439 uh, as an expected payout for your pool if you're attacking. So essentially, the attack uh, on Michel's block four would yield to this expected payoff. Instead of attacking Michel's block, what you could do uh, is just accept it and look at it as the new status quo. So in this example right here, uh, once again, you have Michel's block mined at at slot four right here. And we're again looking just at the next two periods. 
Um, so you have two opportunities of actually mining successful new, uh, successfully a new block. Um, game theoretically speaking, you end up with one of four scenarios. You could either mine none of the next two blocks, so both are created by someone else, or you could create uh, mine one of the next two blocks. And of course, this could either be the next one, so in green right here, or the one after the next one, so the second one with the green right here. Or what also could happen is a scenario where both of the next two blocks are mined by our mining pool. So both of them here shown as green, uh, which means it is mined by our mining pool. Okay, so again, we accept it as the status quo. Um, we just built blocks on top of it. And in this case, what could happen is one of these four scenarios. And of course, when, when we are not creating any of the next two blocks, then our payoff would be zero. When we're creating one of the next two blocks, then it would be 6.25, or again here, 6.25. And when we're creating both of the next two blocks, then it would be 12.5 as a reward that we can get. Now, when you think of the probabilities, the overall um, probability right here doesn't matter because we're not getting, um, I mean, it would be 13, 16, uh, times 13 sixteenth uh, times zero <laughs> obviously then it doesn't matter when you get a reward of zero then we can just ignore it but then we have these two uh, situations where we get 6.25 as a reward and in both cases it's actually 13 sixteenth times 3 sixteenth or 3 sixteenth times 13 sixteenth uh, in both cases you get the 6.25 as a reward and when you add up the probabilities, when you multiply these two fractions right here, uh, then you have 39, 256 uh, times 6.25. And here, of course, the same. Um, these are just the probabilities, probability weighted payoffs for these two scenarios. Um, and then you have this scenario right here where you end up, where the pool ends up with these 12.5 payout. And the probability for that is. 3 sixteenths times 3 sixteenths, which is just 9 256 uh, times 12.5, and your expected payoff uh, will be 2.344. So what you can see right here is that the expected payoff, the expected payout strongly support compliance with the consensus rules. Um, when we go back once again, when you attack Michelle's block, um, then you had an expected payoff of 0 0.3. Four, three, nine, and you can see essentially the attack path right here. The payoff of the attack path is just one of the potential paths right here. So essentially, uh, you're, what you're doing is when you're attacking is you're only uh, accepting the reward from this path, but you're ignoring these two paths where you also get partial rewards, uh, which is of course a really bad decision. Uh, so you're not losing anything. Um, by acting in accordance with the rules, it's actually the other way around. You're winning something when you're acting in accordance with the rules because you have additional options. So you do have an incentive to do so. Um, the relative computational power threshold for rational deviations are two thirds. Or when you have uh, uh, two blocks, or um, it's two thirds. So when you when you have longer time periods, so when you have a, an in, infinite time period, let's say. Um, then the threshold value uh, converges towards one half, and then of course, when even you, this is the the uh, famous 51% uh, attack, where you can say whenever you have more than half of the computational resources at your disposal, then in the long run, when you're looking at a really long run, you can always attack the network. Okay, so it's been essentially the the security of the network also relies that the on, on the fact that the computational resources are distributed among a relatively large number of miners, or at least not concentrated just with one of them. So when you look at the um, examples of process-based forks we've looked at last time, and what the incentives do to them, then we can go with the probabilistic block race first. Uh, here, the expected payout drives a fast resolution along the winning chain. Um, only miner of abandoned block has skewed incentives. Everyone else, as soon as, when, when there are two competing blocks because of this probabilistic block race, uh, 
uh, as soon as one of these blocks has a successor, as soon as one of these chains gets extended, everyone that is independent immediately jumps aboard of this now longer version of the blockchain and then uh, the conflict essentially is resolved. Uh, with block withholding, um, the, uh, there is a risk of losing block reward, uh, whereas there's increased chances for the next period of time, so for the next creation. And this, uh, I can tell you, it is a problem in theory. Um, it's hard to tell how much it is actually in practice, but it, again, it's only relevant for a relatively high relative computation power. So uh, when you have just the average miner um, with a relatively low computation um, resource, uh, relatively speaking, um, then this is not a valuable, uh, valid strategy. It's not a reasonable strategy, um, but as soon as you have a relatively high stake in the network, then this might be a problem. But you have to be aware, this goes back to what I've said earlier, um, this also, when, when somebody realizes that this is happening, and it's, it's, um, it's actually when people watch for it, quite easily detectable, if you're consistently doing that block withholding strategy, and then this might undermine trust in the network and undermining trust will decrease your reward uh, because it will have an effect on the prices of the native protocol asset. Um, and then of course the forced block raise, which is only rational in cases where you have a computational resource of over 51%. Uh, otherwise, but realistically speaking, it's not a good idea to do so. I mean, you can try, um, but it's not a good idea because you will be statistically speaking uh, worse off when you're doing so. So as a result or as, as a preliminary conclusion, uh, Bitcoin incentives effectively protect consensus in absence of mining power concentration. There is one more thing that is really important to understand. Uh, we assume that there is no Goldfinger attack because this may actually be a big problem when people are incentivized from outside the system. So for example, when they are simply motivated to destroy Bitcoin because they have, I don't know, shorted the price or they, they don't like it for whatever reasons. Uh, then of course they can attack it. Here we really just talk about monetary uh, incentives that are endogenous to the system, so within the system. Um, the outside attacks, these so-called Goldfinger attacks, are actually something that may be a reason for concern. But that being said, um, it was actually much easier to perform one of these Goldfinger attacks in the early days. Uh, now, even though from, from the point of view of the financial markets, the values in the Bitcoin network are still relatively low, um, compared to other markets, it's, it is money. I mean, <laughs> it has grown significantly and uh, the market cap we're talking today, the volumes we're talking today, it's not that easy to manipulate it anymore as it has been in, in the beginning. And therefore attacks like that, Goldfinger attacks um, that um, saw uncertainty might not be as easy uh, to realize as this has been the case in the, in the, in the early days where this was a much larger problem than you day. Now let's quickly talk about the minor extractable value and double spend attacks. Uh, double spend attacks is just one example of MEVs and the idea is that miners can choose which transaction is included in the block and this can influence the consensus chain. Uh, they could deliberately delay a transaction blocking it, they could attack a block with conflicting transactions, so essentially then that's that's considered a double spend when, when there is a block included, when there is a transaction included in a confirmed block and a merchant uh, uh, already gave you the, the, the goods in exchange for it, let's say, uh, then um, somebody with mining resources could try to attack this block um, thereby invalidate the transaction that has been included in the other version and include a, a competing transaction that spends the same UTXO on behalf of him or herself uh, in, in this newly created block. But this is just one example. As I said, MEV um, are come in many different facets, especially in all the blockchains and blockchains with a large variety of applications. Um, so for example, on the Ethereum blockchain in the DeFi space, uh, there are many examples of these MEV. And the, the, the risk is that they could potentially skew the incentives for these consensus relevant nodes um, in a way that they don't necessarily act in the best interest of the entire system. So to, to give you an example is, let's say Raphael pays 10 Bitcoin to Lucas to receive a car. And as you can see, this is a relatively old example. <laughs> Um, depending on when you're watching this video, this may or may 
uh, not be uh, worth a lot of money. Uh, let's just go with the example uh, 10, 10 Bitcoin uh, for this car. So Raphael pays these 10 Bitcoin to Lucas. It gets included in the block right here. It gets confirmed. It gets another confirmation, another confirmation. So it is embedded in the blockchain. It is in there. Um, and then he decides to attack. He, de he decides to attack by creating another or trying to create another block on top of this block three. That this transaction right here has not been included yet. And in his um, conflicting block four, so the block four alternative, Raphael includes another transaction, an alternative transaction uh, where he uses the same UTXO that has been used right here. Uh, so again, these 10 Bitcoin units, um, but creates an output on behalf of himself. And he does so to make sure that um, this transaction right here uh, cannot be added to this version, to this sequence later on. Uh, so he basically he invalidates this transaction um, by moving back to this block right here. So it never happened. And then he makes sure that this transaction cannot be simply uh, recreated on this sequence right here by spending the UTXO. And as you can recall uh, from some of our previous lectures, each UTXO can only be spent once. And of course, in this case, it would really depend on how many resources Ruffle can actually spend. Uh, but what is important to understand, the calculations we did earlier um, with the block rewards, they may be really skewed because of that example. Because now Raphael obviously has something at stake and may be motivated also by these um, 10 Bitcoin right here to attack and to um, make this the longer chain. Now, double spend scenarios can also be created without any computation resources. So you don't necessarily must be a miner to be able to create uh, um, uh, double spends, to be able to, to try a double spend. Um, let's let's again, again go with our attacker, Raphael, this time. Uh, he goes to takeaway coffee shop and accepts Bitcoin and uh, he receives a coffee against a uh, yet unconfirmed transaction. Uh, obviously in a coffee shop when you go there you don't have the, an average time period of 10 minutes to wait until the transaction gets confirmed. That wouldn't be a good idea. Um, it doesn't work for these cases. So the coffee shop owner, especially when it's a smaller amount, may accept these Bitcoin even though the transaction, even though it isn't confirmed yet. And he or she may just simply assume that the transaction will get confirmed eventually. I mean, it has been signed by Raphael, it has been propagated, you can verify that. It just hasn't um, been included into or not, not been confirmed in a block yet. So um, what happens is Raphael again attacks, but this time he doesn't control any mining resources himself. What he does is he uh, creates a second transaction, uh, which he quasi simultaneously uh, sends to someone else, in this case to Michel. So the original transaction where he spends his uh, UTXO uh, on behalf of the uh, coffee shop owner, uh, he propagated to tomorrow, but then he creates a second one where he spends the same UTXO and he propagates this one to Michel, let's say. And now we have the simple assumption that in this network, um, these peers, uh, they have connections which are represented by these lines right here. And we also assume that all of these connections have the same speed. Okay, so it's really simplified assumptions. We're not measuring any uh, any connection speeds, any connectivity. We're just going to assume that there are um, these pacemakers, and in every single round, um, basically every peer propagates whatever he or she knows. Uh, every node uh, propagates what he or she knows to the next nodes uh, he or she is connected to. And you can see that right here. Here, Tamara. Um, she is connected to Edith and Michelle. Uh, so when we have the next round, she will communicate uh, her transaction to Edith. She will try to communicate to Michelle. Um, but of course, she already has a transaction right here, uh, a conflicting one, so he's not going to accept it. Michelle, on the other hand, will communicate it to Tony and to the mining pool right here. Uh, they both haven't been aware of the other transaction, so they will accept it to their mempool. And then in yet another round, Marsha will also um, receive the uh, 
um, transaction, the second one, the competing one. So depending on the computational resources, depending on uh, the propagation of the transaction, um, this double span without mining resources, without computational resources controlled by Raphael may or may not succeed. So the better connected the node where Raphael sends his attacking transaction to actually is, uh, the higher the probability that Raphael gets to keep the coffee and the Bitcoin. Uh, because again, the shop owner just simply assumed that this transaction will get confirmed, but Raphael has a conflicting transaction he communicated behind the scenes. Uh, and then, uh, of course, when, when Michel in this case is really, really well connected, and makes up a, with her connections a relatively large amount of the overall network computation resources, um, then there is a relatively large probability that Rothwell can walk away with both. In this case, we have uh, three six teams that the original transaction succeeds because they have Tamara, that is, uh, when she mines the next block, this transaction will get included. And we have uh, seven, 10, 13, 16 that the attacking transaction will get included. So Rafael has a pretty fair chance that uh, he his double spend would succeed. Now, that being said, uh, of course, mm, these double spends, as you have seen, do not require mining power. Uh, the chance of success are not negligible, uh, given enough the time pressure, as we have in a, in a coffee shop, uh, the exchange with the exchange of goods or services. This may actually be reason for concern, but there are two things you can do against it. Um, basically, precautionary measures to minimize the success probability of such attacks. And number one is, uh, of course, waiting for the confirmations. When you're waiting for one confirmation, then uh, you cannot attack this transaction anymore without any computation resources. You could still try to create a deliberate block race, so a forced block race, but that requires resources. That requires you to spend a lot of resources, actually many resources. Um, so whenever possible, wait for one confirmation. But when you cannot wait for one confirmation, as this may be the case with a coffee shop, when you still want to accept it, um, then at least make sure that you have a, a somewhat diverse network connection um, and you still wait for um, 10, 15 seconds. And when you're listening for competing, for potentially competing transactions, uh, and you're, you're realizing that somebody sent a competing transaction, then you could still say, okay, under these circumstances, I'm not going to accept it. The longer you wait after the propagation of your transaction, um, and the longer you wait without, the longer you have time wise without seeing a competing transaction in the network, the higher the probability that your original transaction, so in this case the green one, uh, will already be in most of these mempools. And when it's in most of these mempools, then of course the likelihood, the probability that it will be confirmed eventually uh, is relatively high. So these are the precautionary measures. Um, and if you're, if you're following, uh, I mean, this one, the second one, is fine for really small amounts, for larger amounts. It's always good when you're waiting for one or for really large amounts, even for several confirmations before you accept the payment in Bitcoin. Because potentially speaking, there could still be a conflicting version. There could be uh, a, a temporary fork, let's say, or something else going on. And you can watch out for that, but it's always good when you're waiting for these confirmations. Here, uh, once again, I've already mentioned that in the last video, this majority is not enough, Bitcoin mining is vulnerable. Uh, it's a great paper by uh, Al and Sierra. Uh, and if you're interested in these game theoretical analysis of the Bitcoin network, not just the simplified cases we've looked at in this video, but also the uh, more complex ones, then this is definitely a paper you should look into. So that's it. Stay curious. See you soon.